All right, hello and welcome to another episode of the First Strike Podcast. I'm hosting this weekend. I'm Elliot Fortier, joined by Derek Pite and Andy Robdrup. Uh, we've got a good show for you today. Of course, uh, before we before we begin, I'm going to shout out our sponsor, magic.facetoface.com, and all of the patrons on Patreon that make this happen. Uh, so first thing on the chopping block, we just came off of Grand Prix New Jersey or Magic Fest New Jersey, which was sealed. Uh, I know that Andy went and I was there as well. Derek, unfortunately, didn't link up with us. But uh, pretty exciting main event for me. I ended up coming 20th, going 12 and 3. I've now locked up bronze as of the Pro Tour uh, and got a solid cash. Woo! Um, Andy, how did, how did Grand Prix New Jersey go for you? Because you have also exciting news. <laughs> exciting, yeah. I uh, so I, I uh, let's talk about the main event. So for the main event, I had what I would describe as a below average sealed pool that I built below even more below average than it than it was. And then from there, I uh, I wanted to drop the main event right away. And at two two, I told my friends I wanted to drop, and they're like, "Well, you should at least play the modern PTQ." And I told them I refuse to ask anyone for a deck. I'll post on Twitter that I'm sad and that I don't have a modern deck. And if someone offers me a good modern deck, I'll take it. And Daniel Fournier tweeted at me demanding I take his deck. <clears throat> so I took his deck and I played five rounds of Swiss in the PTQ and I won them all. And uh, then I, the way it works is I started at the 3 p.m. PTQ. So the actual top eight is the next morning at 8 a.m. And so I get there next morning at 8 a.m. One person just doesn't show up. One person doesn't show up to the top eight of this PTQ. And um, <clears throat> so then I play round one against Jund, round two in the top eight against Black Green. And then in round three, I lose, or no, round two, I played against Amulet. And then the last round, I played against Black Green and lost. And it all came down to a top deck for my opponent. Where uh, So they're dead on board. And, and they have to draw removal or they'll die to my Arclight Phoenix. And they draw Tireless Tracker into Land, Crack a Clue, uh, Trophy, my thing. So now not only do I uh, don't have a clock anymore, but they have a threat. So it's probably the actual best possible because it cut off my draws. Only got two turns after that. But it was, it was a pretty heartbreaking loss in the finals of the PTQ. But I didn't have a modern deck for the GP. And now I think I do. I think I'm going to play the Is It? phoenix deck because i think it's one of the best decks in modern and i think i can play it pretty well i made i made some mistakes for sure for sure at that event but i think i can play it pretty well so at least i got a deck out of it and eight booster boxes of the new set uh what happened to your old modern deck they, they banned my old modern deck oh you, you had kci when it got banned i had the entire thing Ask me how many tournaments wow. I played with it. Wow, I can't believe you just asked that. We just had a whole thing last week about how they banned his deck. <laughs> yeah, he I wasn't loses, there, so now I get to dunk on him. Loses a whole final of PTQ, gets his deck banned, and you're still just dunking on him. It ain't oh, over. Oh the best part about gosh. this is I've already dunked on him for this, but now I'm doing it in front of other people. Oh, it, it doesn't matter unless it's on the internet, am I right? Exactly. Honestly, it's, it's hard to be too upset with my results. Like, looking at it in the grand scheme of things, I had never played the deck before. And I went into the tournament feeling pretty down, and I even made some pretty costly errors. But, like, I won a couple rounds that I think I could have won all three games, but somehow managed to, to keep it up for two of them. And, I don't know, I like the deck, and at least I have a deck for the GP Toronto, and... I don't know, some confidence back for, for doing a little bit of winning, even if it was some heartbreak in the last round. My opponent was very happy about winning, though. They were crying, hugging their friends. And honestly, that made me feel a lot better about it, believe it or not, because just seeing how much he wanted it, his first time qualifying for the Pro Tour, it felt good to see someone, I don't know, get, reach their, their dream, even if it had to be at the cost of me. It, was, it, was, it was made me feel a little better. Now, you mentioned earlier that your seal pool was below average. Was that just like, you know, bad rares that you opened? Or do you think that there's some sort of trick to this sealed format and your pool just didn't come together? 
Well, the trick to the seal format for me feels like that the multicolor cards matter a lot, and you have to like fit yourself into like a three color shell. And if you have a three color shell, then you need to hopefully have all your best cards in the best shell that you have for mana. And that just absolutely did not work out for me. I had perhaps the most powerful shell I had just had one dual land and it was not worth running. And it would have to be like straight three color. So instead I played a, a pretty bad deck. I, I misbuilt my deck by quite a bit, I think. But I think my my heart wasn't in it when I just with how the quality of my pool, which obviously is like a pretty toxic mindset that I'm trying to overcome. And I did not do it that time. But with this seal format, it's just another one of those things where it's kind of hit or miss. Sometimes your multicolor cards just are the wrong colors, and compared to your lands, and that matters a lot. Like if you get to play a good two color deck in this format, that's that's the that's the nut. That's the sickness when you get to play a two color good deck. Yeah, I actually agree a lot with you about how you want to end up, you know, playing just a lot of colors actually in this format, which is pretty much the polar opposite of what we saw last format where, you know, you splashed almost if you were in danger and, you know, your card quality was so high in the mono color stuff that it was so easy to just be one guild. Um I actually had the the treat this grand prix of I sat across from my friend Kale Thompson during the deck registration of our sleep and specials. So, you know, he got to look through my pool to verify it while I looked through his. And the very first thing I said to him, like right after deck building, right after deck construction, was, How would you build my pool? He said, Esper. I ended up going Teamer. So, you know, when you, I think I had ended up having like three rug dual lands and then like two Esper dual lands. And my last one was Arakdos or something like that. Uh, so it was really interesting where if you just, you know, follow your mana, you end up with a good deck. I ended up going eight, one and sealed uh, with a, a rug deck with some pretty powerful spells. I ended up sideboarding into black a lot. So I was just a four color deck. I had a couple consigned to the pits. So the seal form is really interesting because, you know, in general, this limited format actually is just very slow. You know, there's no Boros being the fun police. Uh, I think it's very reasonable to be playing like as many gates as you possibly can, just have the best mana you possibly can and play just a pile of powerful spells. Uh, so I said, like I said, I went eight, one and sealed, ended up drafting on day two and going four, two, drafting red green both times. And my, even though I've been preparing for the pro tour and, you know, drafting, talking to other people a bunch, my mindset for this limited format almost went 180 in one Grand Prix, which is, I think, pretty incredible. But like, just being there talking to a bunch of people, my mindset going in was that the green cards are very good. Almost always want to try to be green. You know, it's a green little bit lacking in the common creature front. They have the Soraform Hybrid at two and Rampaging Renhorn at five, but kind of in between, there's not too much. Um, and I thought that, you know, to the best of your abilities, try to avoid white and black just because of the commons in those colors are just very, very poor and only made up for by the white, black, gold cards. And by the end of the Grand Prix, you know, even after, you know, maybe even forcing red green a bit, I even in my second draft where I could have three would to get to the top eight, ended up picking a Sunder Shaman instead of a Kaya's Wrath. You know, after that third round of that draft and talking to people throughout the day, I think that Orsoff is one of the places, like one of the best places to be. You know, we were, I was talking with some people and we kind of decided that, you know, Esper or Mardu, where you're playing as few of the white commons as possible and just playing a boatload of removal spells and a boatload of the Orsoff gold cards, you know, I think it's like pretty incredible. Uh, Andy, did you have thoughts about the limited format that, that you want to share? Yeah, you were going on your tangent about Orzov being bad, and I was like, I thought Orzov was pretty damn good. But then uh, he said that you kind of came around on it in the end. I think uh, I think that is one of your flaws, at least in Limited, is you like to force things a lot because you like understand an archetype. And I think the Kaya's Wrath pick over that card was a ob like obviously in retrospect a huge mistake because Kaya's Wrath is a very very good card. And like the other card's pretty good too, but it is just a five five at the end of the day. 
And I think yeah. uh, going into drafts with like that strong of a preference is is a little rough. Yeah, so I did have a pretty strong anti Orzov preference even at that point halfway through the day. Uh, and I ended up, I I think I asked maybe like ten or fifteen people, <clears throat> and all but one of them said Kaya's Wrath. So who's the one? It was Bosu. Bosu said not even close Sunder Shaman. Uh, well, you know, some things just figure themselves out. For those who don't know, Bosu works at Face to Face Games, so shout out to him. Much love. Uh, but apparently not a limited specialist. Not not someone I should be trusting, at least. Wait, wait, wait. Are we, are we saying that he thinks that Ka- Sunder Shaman is better than Kaya's Wrath? Yeah. He... he when I asked him which I should have picked between Kai's Wrath and Sunder Shaman, pack one, pick one, he said, Sunder Shaman, not close. Huh. You know, like, if he said Sunder Shaman and gave a good reason, maybe. But the not close part makes me think that he, you know, but... Yeah, I'm it's Kai's he... Wrath kind of a little close, but not that close. Well, I mean, I well, mean I, like... I'm sure changing it a bit. He did give a reason. It was that, you know, paraphrasing something from four days ago is more or less that white black has the weakest commons that aren't gold. So if you have, so it's hard to support multiple people in ors off. Uh, you know, you can say the same thing about red green, but Sunder yeah, Shaman is like a yeah, I mean, the wraths are super powerful, obviously, but so is, you know, uncontested Sunder Shaman is also very good. Uh, it was also really interesting at that point to talk to people who, you know, told me, well, you have to pick as the Kaya's Wrath because how are you going to 3-0 with a red-green deck with Kaya's Wrath in the pod? So that was, that was pretty interesting as well. So lots of stuff to think about. This limited format is, is really interesting. It's definitely not just a, a rubber stamp from the last one with different colors. So definitely a lot to explore. And next time I know, pick the, pick the Kaya's Wrath. Well, one of my favorite things that happened during this limited format is that uh, everyone's initial reaction to ill-gotten inheritance compared to like everyone's thoughts of it later like it's so hard to be like a competitive player and look at that card on the surface and just all immediately somehow know that that card's going to be very good and then just as you play the games it just is very good it's so hard to beat that card it's so hard to race it turns on uh whatever that mechanic is every turn spectacle and it's uh just kills your opponent just the game is on a, a clock now, a countdown, so to speak. So that card is pretty good. Yeah, I mean, the first time someone played against played that card against me, I was, I thought I was laughing straight to the bank. I thought this was going to be the easiest win I've ever gotten. My opponent's playing an unplayable enchantment. And then, you know, they killed my one creature, and all of a sudden our, the race is dead even, and they have a... a basically a lava axe sitting on the table. So, you know, definitely easy to misevaluate that card. I think it goes in a lot of shells. It's good if you have a ton of removal spells and the game's going to go long. And also good in an aggressive deck because that can represent the last few points of damage that you need. So definitely, definitely a super interesting card. Uh, whether you want four of them, maybe. But probably one. Derek, have you gotten a chance to play this limited format at all? No, but I've uh, I've seen Edgar play it quite a bit, and what Andy said about ill-gotten inheritance, Edgar would say every time the card was cast against him, and then he would probably proceed to lose in a couple turns. So I feel like that's one of the, the sleeper cards in the early part of the set, because because Andy was right. Like when I see that enchantment, it's sort of like, why am I paying four mana for a do nothing that like maybe deals six damage to my opponent, but I think from what I've seen is that there's a lot of board stalls. There's a lot of incidental damage that you have to get. And the way it combos with the Rakdos uh, guild is very important. So to me, I think there's there's this, this format isn't very uh, surface-based. There's a lot underneath. And I think that uh, hopefully going going forward in the Pro Tour, we see a bit more of that come out when the pros have figured out, like, maybe there's a Slitherblade deck, you know, like that sort of like, idea that one team just sort of like breaks down the wall and like starts 3-0 draft out of nowhere and then like two weeks later that that sort of idea is awful but i don't know i'm hopeful it looks fun um there's a lot going on for the pro tour so i'm really excited specifically also for this limited format 
so moving along, you know, recording this on the day of the announcement, we can't not talk about PAX Boston or PAX East rather. I'm not sure which it is. Uh, they just announced that the Arena Mythic Championship is going to have, you know, they announced more of the players, more Twitch streamers, as well as the way eight people can earn a spot at the table, which is placing in the top eight of the arena ladder. Uh, you know, obviously a lot of descending opinions about this. A lot of people, you know, happy with the people that were invited, angry that their their favorite streamer wasn't invited. And, you know, just in general, upset that they're asking so much of us to qualify. Uh, Derek, I saw you getting into it. What what do you think about this? I saw you on Twitter. What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I, Andy just said in chat that it's not a Mythic Championship; it's the Invitational at PAX, which I, I wasn't, I didn't pick that up. If you misspoke, but I just want to set that straight for the listeners at home. Um, I at first I was I was kind of concerned, and then I, I've been I've been thinking about this for a lot. Like I've been taking a break from streaming. Um, because I don't know the state of where I want to be with magic and streaming in general in the future. And um, I, I, I was a little nervous simply because, like, why not me? Why these people? I have more success in magic than these people do. Um, why not me? And then I, I sort of, like, went to a couple of their Twitch streams and I realized that they're just much bigger Twitch, Twitch streamers than are. And it's an invitational. And th this is a step in the right direction. And I think that Wizards is trying to open themselves up to showcase what Arena can do, not for us, for the people who have a lot of money who would be investing in the game, the players who aren't playing Arena right now or who may be playing Magic in the future, and the esports community as a whole. So to me, this is, this is very exciting. Because as a, from a top-down perspective, even if I don't get invited to this, or even if I don't hit top eight of the, the mythic whatever, I still should be able to get an overflow of people coming into the game looking for ways to, to get to that next level to grow or looking for sponsorships to sponsor people to produce more content to put the sponsorship name on whatever I create. So to me, this is a very, very big announcement for everybody in general, because a lot. I think another thing that a lot of people are, are misunderstanding is that this isn't a takeaway from the pro tour. This isn't a takeaway from the GP schedule. These two things are going to exist um, in together. Although there's not a lot of information about how that's going to function yet, which is, a misstep by wizards, which is maybe we something so we could talk about later. But this is just another good thing going forward. There's next to no negative about this, other than maybe I didn't get chosen or somebody else didn't get chosen. But there's still a chance that I can qualify. Um, so I, I don't understand a lot of the the negativity around it. I don't understand why people are upset about this specifically. I think a lot of people have a right to be upset about the miscommunication issues that Wizards has had, um, giving this to us on the 31st of January, still not talking about GPs, still not talking about pre-TQs, still not talking about how to qualify for Pro Tours other than PTQs. You know, there's, there's so much more information we're missing, and I think that's a huge issue. But as for what they're doing with Arena, I think this is wonderful. It's great. Um, and I, I don't really see any negative that goes along with it. Yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head there that this is this is totally independent, more or less independent at least, of the Pro Tours and the Grand Prix. Obviously, you're going to have you know, the MPL members that are invited to this as well as the Pro Tours. So there is that tiny bit of overlap. But I, I think people shouldn't get confused by this becoming the new norm for competitive magic. Uh, you know, we've kind of had for the past 25 years now is you can play your local tournaments or your local PTQs and get to the Pro Tour and become a, a pro player in Magic. But that's not really the model that any other esport has. And what Wizards is really trying to go for is become an esport. 
you know, you don't see uh, players playing in a, in their local net cafe in a in a thirty dollar entry tournament qualifying for the League of Legends World Championships. It's just not how it goes. You grind the ladder for you know like hours and hours on end to hit the top and hope someone notices you or hope you stay a high enough rank to get invited to a qualifier. And that's how you kind of leapfrog into the pro scene, at least in that game. And it's it's similar in things like Counter-Strike and, and StarCraft. So I think that, you know, what we're seeing here is a, a far cry from what we've previously seen in terms of competitive magic, but really not that different from other esports. So, you know, I, I think this is, Definitely not necessarily a bad thing. I think it could be really interesting. And I, I think you you touch on something that's very important is comparative to other esports. The big difference between Magic and other esports is that you see people playing Magic mostly competitively. So when you look at Grand Prix, when you look at Pro Tours, that's a high level of competition. When you look at some people playing CSGO or some people playing Overwatch, that or like even League of Legends. I have a lot of I know a lot of friends that play League of Legends that aren't really like invested in League of Legends. They just play it to be social or whatever, right? That's how they see League of Legends. And I think that's what magic should be. Up until this point, non-competitive magic was casual magic. And that's commander, FNM, and that's sort of like what we sort of shy away from. But I think there's there's a lot of space to be opened up what in which is like the the in between between the competitive the competitive PT grinders and the compan commander FNM grinders. And I think that has to do with a third party coming in or multiple third parties coming in and holding events um, on arena or in paper as magic starts to grow because we see sponsorships coming in. The more that people notice this game and the more sponsorships there is, um, the more that we'll see bigger events that aren't the Pro Tour. Take a look at the SCG right now. They're booming. They're, they're going off the rails. They have all these sponsorships. They have all these players that they've star built over the years, and they're getting more and more people every single year. They have the biggest Magic stream on the weekend, and they know what they're doing, and that is is what I expect to happen in the next couple of years with more third parties. Um, if you take a look at, I think it's the international um, for Dota, and that's like one of the, one of the biggest watched events in the world. Imagine if you have that, but on MTG Arena. Imagine the overflow of that. You're going to have everybody and their mother wanting to get in on a piece of that pie, and so that means endorsements, sponsorships. Everybody that you know is going to start playing Magic. And it's just going to be so good for the game. I just, I can't wait. I'm excited. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot to be excited about with this uh, magic becoming an eSport thing. Just uh, like more eyeballs, more people playing it is going to obviously facilitate a lot of growth for magic. Like magic has had like one of the worst online game systems I've ever seen with magic online when you compare it to like other professional gaming like uh, games at all. And now it's actually a good game. Magic Arena is a fantastic game. And I think a lot of people are upset because people, what everyone was expecting was to understand what the Pro Players Club is going to look like and how to qualify for the Pro Tour, not by spiking a PTQ, if that's even going to be a thing. And that's what a lot of people wanted. And people were a little bummed about the whole coverage thing that happened the past week that everyone's just kind of sulking and pretty mad right now. So I think that's why there's a lot of negativity towards it initially. But I actually, I like the list of players that they picked. Like, obviously, they, they picked the MPL. And I like that they picked a lot of people who are, like, range a lot. There are a lot of different people. There's a lot of like women. There's a lot of uh, foreign people. There's a lot of non-binary people. Just a whole lot of different people. It's going to bring a whole lot of exposure to this event. So I think it's awesome, the, the people that they picked. And I think the tournament's going to be awesome. And it's even a pretty unique format. like, And it's, it's like double elimination. And I think that's pretty cool. It's still best of one. But I, I don't mind. I don't hate best of one as much as everyone else does. I think best of one's biggest problem is like maybe Nexus of Fate and Mono Red. But like Watsi is going to be building cards with that in mind now. So I think you're going to see some cards that will interact better. There's going to be more interaction in standard 
standards are going to get even better. They're going to keep printing cards that do lots of stuff. Keep printing Knight of Autumns. Knight of Autumn is just the quintessential card that like does something against everything. Like think Nexus of Fate, it kills the Wilderness Reclamation. It gets Mono Red. It gains four life against uh, like a regular deck. It's a four three. That's the kind of card design that we're going to see that's going to create a super interactive standard and have some really fun games of Magic where there's a lot of decisions and a lot of interacting with what each other are doing. So I think Magic's in a good place. I think this Invitational is a super cool thing, and I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be awesome to watch. I can't wait to start watching like high level events on Arena, and I love that I'm seeing people, other like. Uh, organizations starting to run events like i see there's one for quebec an invitational and i'm like oh my god i wish i was in that or like you see you other qualify for that oh can you yeah they have they invited i think it's eight or ten people and there's 24 so, slots they, they're going to announce it tomorrow how you can uh, qualify i was i was going to look into doing it i think it's awesome i think this yeah. it's like just imagine that you could just sit at home and just play in random arena tournaments for money like you can in hearthstone sometimes like there was already a couple events that happened maybe a couple weeks ago where like first place was like 50 bucks second place was like 25 bucks but it's free to enter and it's streamed on twitch and that like there's only 24 people or something i think it was like that kind of stuff's just going to keep popping off and if more people are watching then it's going to be worth it to the sponsors just run these random tournaments which is exactly what we want for the growth of magic to, to keep it going yeah there's um i know uh Elias V is running her own event tomorrow. Um, there's uh, a network called Shadow Network or something, and they, they have a discard where they post um, MTG Arena tournaments that you can sign up for and win money. Like, it's small amounts of money, but, like, it's money. And then they had the, the Twitch Rivals thing a couple weeks ago or, like, a month and a half ago that was aired on, like, the front page of Twitch where a bunch of Arena streamers played in it and a bunch of non-Arena streamers played in it. Like, I was talking with somebody, and... Maybe we can get to this a bit later about the the monetary cutbacks and what they've been doing at the GPs and stuff. But I, from my understanding, is that Wizards did not comprehend how big Arena was going to be, and then once it got so big, they're like, "We have to do something about this, and if we don't, we're going to lose it." And so, from my understanding, is this is them adjusting, and this is them doing all these things in such a short period of time with no like context because th this wasn't planned Th to me this is like them saying we have to do something right now and i think it's good obviously it can go bad if they keep making decisions like this that happened last weekend but to me this is just amazing that it's growing this exponentially yeah it's possible that they had like a couple year plan and then it just blew up very fast and very hard immediately yeah. And they just had to stoke the flames. They had to keep it going because like the last thing you want to do is like have people lose interest in your game because you stopped like right, working right. on it. Right. Or so they, they, just... they have like a, a budget that they have to, to stay in. And if like, if you have shareholders or whatever, you can't just say like, we need X amount of money. You, you have to stay in the budget. Right. Obviously it's, it's not really great for us or the state of magic, but I knowing this now, I think it, it, it looks better than it did maybe last weekend. Uh, I have this sort of, uh, un, like, uh, un, I don't have a reason for it, but I have faith that the whatever system Watsi implements will be okay. I think that's from just all my experience of playing Magic when they changed from the P PPT, changed to the PPTQ system and added Planeswalker points, took away ELO. I just keep looking at it, and I was like, in the grand scheme of things, I could still try to qualify for the Pro Tour, and there was still a dream there. And I could not, like, I don't have to win the Pro Tour to, like, kind of live the dream. So my hope is that that kind of thing will still exist. I really do. <laughs> it is definitely for sure interesting what we're going to see out of the future of Magic that's not Mythic Invitational related as well. Because, you know, you sort of mentioned third-party uh organizations stepping up and running tournaments and you know i i likened it to league of legends and starcraft and counter-strike earlier and what's what i think is really cool is we're kind of going backwards uh you know not in a bad way necessarily but a lot of these big games started with third-party 
organizers running tournaments, sort of like a grassroots thing that that grew and grew to the point where a competitive scene was, you know, necessary to be supported by the developer. And that's how you, you know, before there was the LCS, you had tournaments at DreamHack and such, where, you know, pro teams sponsored players and the developer really had nothing involved. You know, maybe they sponsored the event and, you know, obviously signed off or, to some regard, but it was really just the third party took it totally in their hands. Or And and at the end of the day, it all started back to one guy had an idea to run a tournament for League of Legends at some point. So I think it's really interesting that we're starting backwards from we have the support from the developer of the game. They're investing a ton of money into the pro scene. And now we're going to see third party to third parties kind of pick up the slack for what we've previously seen, you know, maybe at, to the prestige, up into the prestige of the SCG tour. I saw a lot of people on Twitter saying, you know, I'm super glad I've been choosing to grind the SCG tour instead of Grand Prix because, you know, this new announcement is, you know, sort of laughing in the face of the people who've been grinding Grand Prix. But really, I think this is just, you know, uh, strengthening both the pro scene as the de facto top tier of magic you know people laughed when you watched a grand prix coverage and there was someone who at the start of day one was playing poorly because this was being shown off as you know the prestige premier tournament in magic and and i think now when we have that air associated with magic we're going to be talking about the mpl we're going to be talking about the invitation we're going to talk about these million dollar tournaments and then when you take a step down you're going to be looking at things like scg uh and things like that 3k tournament in in quebec that's coming up you know these sort of mid-tier tournaments that really uh wizards of the coast doesn't, doesn't have too much to do with so i don't know i'm excited for the future um you know i'm i i can't imagine what they have in store for us i, I hope it gets announced soon uh i was giddy this morning when they said there would be some sort of announcement coming up so really looking forward to the rest of it um so Elliot, I have a question. So for most esports, is it the developer of the game who runs the tournaments, or is it third party for most of them? It it depends. I don't on, know. I did a lot of research when when Arena said they were going to do esports, and for for games like I think Smash specifically had a very grassroots upbringing, but like the international by Dota is run by I think it's Valve that owns them, yep. and that that's the biggest um event for dota and same for league of legends i think it's run by the owner of league yeah i Riot think games. Riot uh, games runs the world championships in league of legends as well as the major all of the major leagues uh they have lcs in north america europe they have a not sure what the name of the league necessarily is called in korea but they have another one in china as well uh, so really, everything at the major stage is ran by Riot Games for League of Legends. Um, you mentioned Smash Bros as well. That's a community. Um, I know some people who are are really involved in that. That community is kind of very interesting in 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 the sense that it was grassroots 15 years ago and is to to some degree still grassroots now. We're yeah. only now seeing Nintendo get involved in their tournaments. So. You know, yeah. they're kind of even progressing slower than Magic did and still doing great. You know, yeah. Smash tournaments are super hype. I try to watch them on Twitch when I can, even though I don't really follow Smash and it's just always exciting to watch. So, I, uh, I, I try, because like when I when I was streaming Arena, I was noticing that people like Hooglin, I think it was uh, Caleb and MTG Nerd Girl got signed to Tempo Storm. And I'm like, whoa, they got signed to Tempo Storm. Like, does that mean they're going to be playing events like the international or worlds like league? And so I did all this research and found out that like Tempo Storm's not necessarily one of the big ones like Cloud Nine, but they they still play in events if they can. But it's mostly content creation. And so I went like down this deep like sort of esports hole, and uh, a lot of it basically uh, is mirrored to regular sports uh, teams in that there's like the nhl there's um the the league like the marlies would be for the toronto maple leafs the the farm team if you will and then there's like the ohl which is the ontario hockey league and they like feed up and you get scouted by teams and there's that sort of thing and so like i think 
in the future, if, if magic takes off, like we're expecting it to, you can expect that sort of thing in the future. And then you can have third parties running these events and you can have wizards running these events and star cities running these events. And, and I think when people say that they're very happy, they've been playing star cities as sort of like, it's a slap to the face. It's like, it's not a slap to the face. This is great for you. Now that star city is going to get all these eyes, star city is going to grow. And if you're already an enfranchised player for star city, imagine what's going to happen. Like, this is so good for you. Like, I'm just blown away that people people think this is a negative or they think that they're getting the short end of the stick. Like, this is just good for everybody. Yeah, I think that's a good point, likening it to just actual sports as well. You know, you look at the MPL of 32 players and we have the Invitational now and the Mythic Invitational that has, I think, 64 players. And, you know, there's, I, I think, just over like 2 million people that have played in Grand Prix and Pro Tours. Two million different people, and obviously millions more play Magic. But like, let's say, let's say three million people take it seriously and play competitively. Competitively, I I did air quotes. Uh, having sixty four represent the the highest percentage of professional play isn't really that unlike something like the NHL, where the NHL a team has uh, you know like twenty players roundabout uh, and on any given roster and there's 32 teams. So there's, you know, 600 players representing the top percentage of hockey players in the world. But do you think there's more or less than 30 million people that play hockey, you know? So I, I think in terms of like the wedge of where we're highlighting as the professional play, it's, you know, it seems small. It seems like focusing on 64 players is not a lot, but, you know, it, it kind of, balances out to to what we see in other fields as well and this is an invitational this isn't the pro tour if you if you think about the nhl like what percentage of high level hockey players do you think make the nhl it's got to be like less than five percent right it's it's got to be such a small amount or even the um the football league and what's the football league called national football league. football oh the pigskin throw the nfl like or or NBA, like the actual percentage of competitive college players that make the NBA or the NFL is so small. And you think about all these competitive players and and like where are they going? Oh, they're still playing competitive basketball, just not on the M not in the NBA or not in the NFL. There's like different outlets for them to play, or they're coaching, or or they're helping people train, or they're becoming personal trainers, right? Like you have to understand that all these people that are trying to be professional magic players will still probably need teams. Like they'll still probably need theory crafting. They'll still probably need coaches to help them like work through these, these mental strains of grinding arena all day and staring at a screen. Like to like, I just can't, I don't know. I'm so excited. They're, like we've talked so much about this. And I just want to keep talking about it. Um, it's, it's huge and it's, it's great. And we can't wait. I think that's actually a really cool point. You know, previously in terms of what we've seen of the pro circuit is is these pro teams form testing groups. So when you have a pro tour that has between, let's say, 400 and 500 players, it's, you know, pretty simple for a group of pros to team up. You know, you have mega teams in the past of close to 20 pro players testing all in one house. But if you're looking at the MPL, you can't have 20 of these pros teaming up because there's only 32 of them. It doesn't make sense. So if you want to be getting a leg up in the MPL competition, you know, you're going to want to have a maybe a small group. You know, maybe you look at, I think, you know, you look at the PGO. They're probably going to be testing together, of course. Maybe some other players from the Pantheon that are in there. You know, not everyone off the top of my head I know. But, you know, even if there's a player that's not quite in the MP MPL, it makes a ton of sense for them to be surrounding themselves still with pro players or, or at least pro caliber players. So, you know, maybe down the line, if, if you have a member of the MPL spent, sponsored by a team like Tempo Storm, maybe all of a sudden Tempo Storm's knocking on Brad Nelson's door because they yeah. want Brad Nelson to help their MPL team. Yeah. Well, that's like, really interesting. Yeah. So like, this is what I said when I said I went down a hole looking at other esports and I was watching a couple cloud nine videos 
and they they sit in a room with their coach who is uh significantly older than the cloud nine players um and he basically walks them through what they're going to be doing how they're going to be playing what their roster is what their game plan is what their itinerary is and and how what they're they're going to be doing so they can win this event because they have to sell spots in these seats so that investors will come and watch them so they can make more money so they can keep running their pro league so they can keep doing all these things and so when you have the mpl let's say you have like maybe it won't be brad nelson maybe it'll be somebody who won the last local grand prix or who's been on the pro tour for, for a couple years now coming in and coaching these people i tweeted that exact point i just made uh and jessica estevan i think that's how you pronounce it the the woman that won the uh australian gp um said the exact same thing that you said she really wants to do well in this event but she doesn't have a team like pgo so maybe there's an esports team that is looking to recruit her to play on their team wear their jersey uh work with their other teammates to help them get better at magic so they can take a run at these arena tournaments and it, it just keeps growing and growing and snowballing there's like all this all this space for for people to to work in and play in and money to be made um and and i think people are very close-minded when it comes to this like we've been led by wizards for so long like what a grand prix is what the pro tour is i think we need to open up our uh, creative brains and really focus on what we can do to make this grow in our area um and i think this this sort of throws back to wizards making a statement about giving out pro tour invites to local events that are, are really big. And so like one has been given to the SCG Invitational. So all of a sudden, if you have a team that wants to train for the SCG Invitational, the queue for the pro tour to get on the MPL, maybe you have an esports team that's trying to find sponsorships so they can work together to win this Invitational. Or maybe you have a Canadian one in the face-to-face -face games or the Quebec arena league that we were just talking about you know or the europe australian like it just keeps going and going and going and i think there's so much that we could talk about for just like hours on and like i've said this 40 million times and i'm super excited um i don't see a lot of negatives going on for this yeah it's actually something i hadn't really considered before now is you know obviously it's sort of bad beats for the the people who barely miss out on, uh, you know, that eight, the eight spots to get into the Invitational. But how sick is, you know, I came ninth or 10th this season, you know, people were getting emails sent out today about their final rank in the ladder. So, you know, you even have sort of a proof, a piece of proof to prove it and uh, uh, to show, you know, how, how sick is it? You know, hey, I saw you're playing in the Invitational. You know, I want to test with you. I want to work with you or I want to apply to, to be part of your team. Look, I've come ninth this season, you know, 63rd last season, and, you know, you uh, can kind of build your resume out of it. And, and uh, this has been, uh, when I talk about if like, that often magic players rank how good magic players are. And so when you see people, somebody spike a top eight of a PT, you often say, well, how good are they really? That they just have a good deck for the weekend, that they just get lucky. And, and over a career, you can tell when a player is good. And so if you're missing on that ninth spot or you're missing on that MPL from a proper couple of pro points, to me, if you're good enough and you have the fire, you'll make it eventually. And it's not, you shouldn't get hung up in the just misses. You should get hung up or you shouldn't get hung up at all. You should try to monetize your knowledge because if you have the knowledge to come ninth or you have the knowledge to like make that Grand Prix top eight, you should be able to put that somewhere else and, and sort of like grow your brand. And, and I think that's another thing that Wizards has done sort of very well with Arena for once. And, and that's sort of like open up the door for this to be possible. Um, and people just have to like walk through it and do it themselves, you know? Um, I, I think I think the people who get hung up are on like missing the top eight or missing like I was 33rd on pro points are being very short-sighted and are thinking about the long run in that like, there's not just money coming from Wizards, there's money coming from outside also. And uh, if you're focused on just the money, like there's other ways for you to get it. Um, up until this point, like even having a minimum wage job was probably better than playing Magic full time. So maybe the money wasn't about, it wasn't about the money to begin with. You know what I mean? Um, I think a lot of people are just getting hung up on the wrong the wrong point. 
Okay, so I mean, it sounds like we could talk forever about this. Maybe, maybe when Car is here next week to rein us all in, we can we can have a bit more of a discussion as well. Uh, just to move it on, we have the RPTQ this coming weekend on Sunday, February third. Uh, it's standard. Uh, I don't think any of here any of us here are playing it. I know I'm playing the one later in the month. Andy, I think you you said you were playing on Moto. Is that right? Uh, yeah, so I was going to go to Toronto this weekend, but uh, it ended up being the moving day for me and my fiance to our new apartment. So unfortunately, I won't be able to do that. And then at that point, I could go to Montreal, but I'd have to take a train. So I might just play on Magic Online for, for old time's sake. So uh, have you been playing a lot of standard? Do you, you know, I'm sure there's people in the nation that are qualified. What do you think they should be playing? Uh, that's That's a... It's a very good question. I think the best deck is Saltai. I don't think you can go wrong by playing Saltai. I think a lot of people, uh, if you're playing a lot of Magic Online for testing, Mono Red has just disappeared off the planet. I've played it maybe once in the past 20 matches. So it might be a good time to actually play Mono Red. And some players that I think are pretty good still like the deck. So I think that could be a good choice. And other than that, I'm still doing pretty well with the Nexus to Fate decks, despite despite all the, the fact that they did a lot of losing. But I think a lot of people are sequencing things poorly in the decks or building them wrong. But there's there's a, so much room to explore, and I just want I want some other people to do it. I've lost a lot of play points in the last little bit, just testing a lot, trying everything. And I hate, I hate a lot of decks, but I like a lot of decks. I like some certain cards, but I hate some certain cards. It's a, it's a good standard format because there's like 10 plus viable decks. So narrowing it down, so you can't go wrong with Saltai. I think you can't go wrong with Mono Red. Those two are the safest choices for sure. Yeah, Mono Red's super interesting for me. It's, uh, you know, sort of the deck that everyone thought would be the most powerful right out of the gates. Uh, and it's really, it really seems to be a really love it or hate it thing where, you know, you you see a lot of people who are playing Saltai and Nexus of Fate decks. You know, I myself, I, I think I played like a league with Mono Red and didn't really like it that much. Uh, I don't know about you, you other guys, but you have other people who have been playing Mono Red for the past two weeks now and, you know, love it. You know, they're like sending screenshots of killing people on turn four or five, I think, and just doing overall busted things with all the cheap burn spells. And then you have you know, some of the more embarrassing draws in a mono red when your opponent has a wild growth walker, for example. So uh, that's definitely an interesting one. One that, you know, even if it's not, like you said, disappearing on moto, you really do have to have it in the back of your mind. Because, you know, if you cut the wild growth walkers from your Saltai deck and don't have enough moment of cravings and, and the like to, to recuperate, you're going to find yourself in the hole. Uh, Derek, are, are you going to just tell people to play Saltai or... What do you have for us? Uh, honestly, like, I haven't been playing that much standard. Um, to me, I think that Krasis is the best deck card in the format. Um, I think that people are building their Saltai decks atrociously. Um, and I think that's because nobody really has any direction. A lot of people to me, seem like they need to be told how to build their deck. Uh, they need to be told what cards are good in the mirror, and they need to be told what cards are good against other matchups. Hence, the side I, I call the sideboard guide era. If you ask for a deck list, everybody always asks for a sideboard guide. There's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people have full-time jobs, and they're working on other things in their life. They don't have time to build their own sideboards. But I think a lot of people are also kind of fish in that sense, in that they don't really understand how to sideboard or what's going on or why things are happening. So to me, like if you're playing a salt high deck, you better be very confident with your ability um, to beat mono red because like I, we discussed, I think mono Red's the second best deck and I think it'll beat up on people who aren't ready. And I think that mono red is just more powerful than it was last format. And if it's more powerful than it was last format, it's really going to punish the people who don't know what's going on or even the people who do know what's going on and just get a little lucky. So if, if it were me this weekend, um, I would play Mono Red or Saltai. I'd probably play Saltai because I'm an extremely mid-range player. But I, I've been telling a lot of people to play Mono Red because I think it's actually one of the it's actually well positioned if people don't expect it to happen or like be as powerful as it is. 
I'm I'm sort of interested. I, I've been playing a lot of standard as well, or or at least following a lot of standard, uh, especially. And you know, I think that it's going to be really interesting to see if if there's a deck that can go bigger than Saltai. You know, people are playing incubation druid Saltai now, trying to get the biggest Crassus. Other people are are being more traditional to the black green deck we saw last format and just saying I'll eventually put ten lands into play and play my big Crassus that way. So I think I think it's gonna be really interesting to see if there's a deck that can go bigger. Uh, that's not really something that that was possible last format. The black green deck always had, you know, Vivian Reed, Find Finality, and Carnage Tyrant as the pillars of really the the most expensive, baddest, biggest threats you could be playing in the format. Um, and, but now now that we have Crassus, which is like a fireball creature almost, there is a reward for your green deck having twelve mana you know, ahead of schedule by having, you know, eight mana on turn five or f- five or six or something like that, you know, playing a big Crassus is going to demand a threat or d- demand an answer rather. So, you know, maybe is, do you think there could be a deck that can go bigger than Saltai? Um, I don't think there is because they have Crassus. I don't think it's possible for them to have a deck that goes bigger than Saltai, but I do think the way you should be trying to beat salt tides either going through them or going underneath them. And one of the things it actually happened last weekend and it happened really early last format is we had the Phoenix deck pop up and I, for the life of me for the first like two or three weeks could not beat the Phoenix deck because I was trying to beat the mirror so hard and I wasn't ready to shift my deck list. And we saw it this weekend. Also, I think Brad Carpenter went almost undefeated um, to top eight, the SCG and really put the drake deck on the map and i think the drake deck and the phoenix deck those builds are one of those decks that are really good um at just going through every deck they put a threat into play um and they protect it or they, they play around your cards really well and stick their own threat or have the best answer and beacon bolt with drakes so to me there is no deck that's going to be going over, but there will be a couple decks in the format that are trying to like go through or go around or go underneath. Um, and I think those decks are very unexplored right now because a lot of people are playing Krasis. Um, and one of the things about mid-range decks is you have to know what you're beating in order to beat it. You can't just like show up with a bunch of generic removal spells if your opponent's deck is good against those removal spells. You know what I mean? So I think... I think like Phoenix is is a decent choice if you just want to beat Salt High, but I do think it's not great against Mono Red um, or Control. So that that's the other thing. But it it it's an interesting format for sure. It sort of mirrors the last format with a couple different interesting iterations. Um, yeah, I luckily don't have to play the RPTQ because I'm already queued. So I do think that is it. Uh... Is a Drake decks is, are actually just pretty good, and they're just almost card for card identical to the last format, except with uh, Terramander in it now. And that card actually serves a great purpose in the deck as being a one mana card, a cheap cheap threat, and that matters so much in a deck that's playing spell pierces and dive downs. And uh, I'm interested to see maybe Arclight Phoenix the card will be playable again because it, it it stopped being playable because the is it Drake's deck was just so good at controlling decks. But now that the control decks are a little better, I think it's kind of hard to just protect your Drake's enough that maybe uh, the arc light is exactly what you need. Cause like that strategy is typically going to be good against uh green black, even with graces, I think it'd probably still be favored. And uh, it, as long as you can figure out a way to be red, I know before with the, like Enigma Drake's very good against red and now, they're playing a lot of burn spells, so the spell pierces are very good. But it's hard to play spell pierce and arc light phoenix because they don't go well together, obviously. So I'm interested to see. Maybe there's an arc light phoenix set because that's not been explored that much, and the card's obviously ridiculously powerful. I think the first time I saw someone attack, play a terramander on turn one, attack with it on turn two, and cast chart, of course, my jaw dropped. So, you know, blue red phoenix or blue red drakes definitely could be something to look forward to. But it it sounds like the three of us are sort of, you know, together one voice saying play play salt high red or maybe a reclamation deck. I think I think we can all agree for this weekend. Yeah. Um I don't recommend playing a reclamation deck. 
I, I don't. I don't think it's. I, they're not solved enough yet. And they're the other decks are solved. solved. They're not <laughs> possible. They're not. They're, Sal like Saltai is very is like has a lot of good tools, so it's hard to vote against that. Deck, well, I you know? mean, it's it's not just Saltai, right? It's the fact that Control has more Mortify and other ways to interact, and the fact that Mono Red kills you on turn five. You know, like I. I don't want to say that I'm right about this one because I was probably wrong about every other one, but uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't play Drake's. The the Terramander chart of course play is sweet, but it's very loose to shock. So <laughs> you gotta you gotta be careful with that one. All right, so I guess I guess it is just mono red and salt. I were saying then, so you know, hopefully you have your Crassus already because MTG Finance those are thirty five dollars. Take your they money at the door. They went up, they went from like $10 to 40 tickets on Moto in like literally 10 hours and are now at 25 tickets. It's insane. Finance, finance, etc. Uh, so obviously the weekend after, after the RPTQ, we have the Grand Prix in Toronto, which is modern. Uh, you know, Andy, you mentioned earlier, you think you found your deck with Blue Red Phoenix after your PTQ result. Um, Derek, you said you haven't been playing standard. Is it is it modern that has your eye right now? No, I've been playing a lot of Popper, although I did play um, like a modern 3K local to me last weekend, and I lost in the finals. Um, I was playing Mono Red, which feels very powerful. I'm not entirely sure if it's powerful because people are getting greedy with the post KCI ban or if it's powerful because it's actually powerful. Um, it's probably what I'll set on for the GP anyways, just cause I don't want to learn the format and I don't want to put in time and effort to uh, figure out a good deck to play and it's pretty cheap. So um, I'm probably going to play that. And then, yeah just not play modern until I have to again. <laughs> yeah, I am sort of in the same boat. The last modern tournament I played in was uh, the RPTQ back in December where I played KCI. And as I so happily pointed out to Andy earlier, it's not an option anymore. So Burn was actually one of the decks I was looking at as well. Um, I think, you know, Skewer the Critics is really just an unbelievable card for that archetype going up to, you know, 20 copies of Lightning Bolt effectively really all that decks wanted forever has been redundancy. Um, so I think it's, this might be the critical mass where burn is all of a sudden a really important deck for people uh, to be on their radar, which, which I don't think it really has been for a while. I think that, you know, from a spectator point or per spectator perspective of modern, it's sort of being a deck that, you know, you have in the back of your mind, is just kind of always medium tier two, but you know, skewer the critics. I think I think it could be the real deal. And I think if you see me at GP Toronto, I, I think I'm going to be casting lightning bolts. So, uh, but Andy, you're you're dead set on on is it Phoenix probably? Yeah, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, Daniel Fournier for his is it Phoenix list a couple days or three like a week before the tournament and just play exactly that. That's my whole my whole turn. My whole uh, preparation is going to be that. It's modern. Let's let someone else stress out about it. Yeah, I stressed out before my last RPTQ. I ended up playing KCI with near zero practice. So I'm going to try to slide into the Grand Prix with near zero practice as well. Bolt some people. Um, so it seems like that's that's all we have for the show today. Uh, you know, again, thank you to our sponsor, magic.facetoface.com. Uh, shout out to the Patreons, the Patrons on Patreon, rather. Um, and thanks for watching, guys. On behalf of me, Carr, who's not here, and then Derek and Andy, have a good one.